everybody, happy new year. Dylan Bowman here from Free Trail. And in the first 10 days of 2024, we're gonna be rolling out our Trail Runner of the Year Award. This is our favorite time of year to celebrate all the great athletes and performances that made 2023 a year to remember in trail running. And this year, we're super happy to have partnered with Ketone IQ to help bring the award to life. Make sure you check this product out. Super cutting edge, futuristic endurance sport nutrition product ketone supplement guaranteed to give you better focus and help you rip out on the trails. We have exclusive discount code that you can take advantage of here, hvmn.com forward slash free trail 30. That link is also in the description here on YouTube. Enjoy these interviews with some of the best athletes in the world. And thanks for helping us celebrate 2023. Remy Bonet, welcome to the podcast. Congratulations on being the number two trail runner of the year. Hey, how are you? Uh, how are you feeling to end another amazing season of competition? And as you launch into another season of competition as a ski mountaineering athlete, how was 2023 for you? Yeah, for me, it was like kind of the, the perfect year apart, apart one race in Switzerland that I really want to win in the future. But uh, like the rest of the year, like the skimo season was amazing and the, the trail season was also the one of my best. So I can complain about it. Yeah, we'll come around and talk about that race in Switzerland, Sears and all that you just mentioned. But specifically, as you just mentioned, it was a, the year of your dreams, it seems like. Double world champion as a ski mountaineering athlete. And now you're the two-time champion of the Golden Trail World Series, which is unquestionably the most competitive racing series on the planet. Do you consider this your best year as an athlete holistically, considering both sports together? Yeah, I think so, because... To do it once, it's hard, but to do it uh, two times in a row, it's even harder. And I think I am really proud of that. And I will try to do it a uh, third time next year, but uh, we'll see what happens. Amazing. I was just talking to Sophia Lockley and sort of contemplating how, like, as you go into ski, um, ski mountaineering season, now where the psychology is at, and if you ever get burnt out on the fact that you have to be world-class in two sports and that you don't really have a break from competition throughout the year. Yeah. I think I take two weeks during the whole year, like one week after the skimo season and one week after the trail season. So it's a, uh, like not much, but for me, like, no, I know that it's working. We plan the season well with my coach. And so I am happy like that. And uh, the results are here to prove that uh, it's enough for me. So we'll continue like that uh, in the future. And so Paint a picture of what ski mountaineering season looks like between now and April or May. Because aren't you racing like almost every single weekend for the next three or four months? Yeah, it's starting next week. Like we have the Open Championship and then we have like until March. It's every weekend we are racing World Cups like two or three times per week. We have races. So it's kind of a lot of races, but it's not the same as in running. You don't have the impact on the legs. Like it's uh, for the muscle, it's a e kind of easy sport because you don't have uh, like the impact of the down downhill. You you just ski down, so it's why you can like do a lot of races and a lot of elevation gain during the winter. But uh, yeah, it's kind of intense, but I like it, and yeah, it's part of my of my life now. Yeah, you just mentioned your coach, and I recall just watching some of the Golden Trail Series races this year people talking about how you had switched coaches. I'd love to hear you just sort of talk about your relationship with your coach, whether it's the same person that helps you with both ski mountaineering and trail running and how that change in coaching has helped you to develop into this world-class athlete who's been so dominant the last couple of years. Yeah, for me, it was a big change because like, I think it was three years ago when I started with him and now he's doing me like the two sports uh, full time like for for skimo and also for trail and i think it was a big change before because before i was doing all all myself and i think i was doing way too much training like uh, i think i was doing like maybe 150 hours more that i am doing now during the full year so it was kind of like a, i was a bit stupid in my head i, I was thinking that if you want to be strong you have to do like way more than the other and so like from then I start with him and I think we train now really specifically for, for big goals. 
And I think that makes a lot of changes. And now I am like full confident when I train because I know that he 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 give me training to be the to the best. And when you have like a, another people who check what you are doing, it's always easier because when you check yourself, all is all is good. Wow. What an incredible lesson for our audience. You can reduce your training by 150 hours and get better as an athlete if you train more intelligently and more specifically. So talking about your trail running season this year, you started with a fourth place at Zagama, which is a race you've won back in 2018, I believe it was. Talk about managing that transition between ski season and running season and how you felt about your performance at Zagama this year. Yeah, it was hard because at the beginning I didn't plan to go to the Gamma and I changed a bit my mind at the last time. So like I knew that I was not ready to to win the race, but I give it a try. And sometimes you you don't know, sometimes it's work. So I think for me it was a good training for the for starting the season. And I saw that the shape was kind of good, like for the, the training I did with the with the running shoes. So it was a good motivation to like to go to Marathon du Mont Blanc and show what, what I am capable of. Yeah, it's a well, perfect segue. So you did show everybody what you were capable of at the Mont Blanc Marathon. And I would encourage people to go back and watch the replay of the broadcast because you were, you know, pretty much in control of that race from the very beginning, broke the course record, really important race there in Europe. And that put you in the driver's seat to go ahead to eventually win the Golden Trail World Series again. Talk about that race. Did that sort of give you the confidence that, you know, you were in as good or better shape as last year? Yeah, for me, it was important to to win that one because I had a, a lot of bad stories with uh, with the Marathon du Mont Blanc. Like I dropped, I think, uh, two or three times. So it was not a good. Uh, and I think I finished two times fourth like just out of the podium. So I I had to win it once and uh, that was the perfect year because I was feeling really good from the start and the finish. And it's the first time that I really managed well the the full marathon effort. So I was not destroyed at the end and I I really play my my card like when uh, when I was the the best in the in the climbs and yeah. I was going like kind of not too hard in the downhills and so I could finish well the, the marathon distance. So I was really happy about that. And at the end, it was a really nice time. So yeah, like, very nice yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> and then you came to the beautiful United States of America. And oh my gosh, Remy, I'm sure you consider one of the greatest performances and one of the greatest sporting achievements of your life, breaking Matt Carpenter's course record at the Pikes Peak ascent. It was, you know, one of the great single performances in trail running history that you were able to achieve there. Just talk about that. What was it like to, I mean, was it a goal of yours to break Matt Carpenter's course record? Did you know whether or not you were on pace and, and what did it feel like to achieve something that a lot of people thought was never going to be broken? Yeah. And I think it's why, like, I was really motivated to, to break it because everyone was saying that it was impossible. And I hear a lot of story that he, like people saying that he was cutting the trails and blah, blah, blah. So I was like really motivated to, um, like, to show to everyone that, uh, it's possible. And, and I, I am pretty sure that it's even possible to go faster because now I know that I go, I can go under two hours. Mm -hmm. So. So oh, yeah, it was a big motivation. And after Sierzinal, like I had a big disappointment. So it was even I was even more motivated to like to like to yeah to prove that I am one of the best climbers of the world. So yeah. like then I trained hard, like I do a lot of altitude training at home and came a bit earlier in Colorado. So like uh, all was uh, was good to to break the record this year. Yeah. Somebody posted after you crossed the finish line that you had said that you intend to return in 2024 and try and go under two hours. Was that accurate? Is that your intention for 2024? Yeah, maybe not in 2024, but I will go for sure once and even to break once the, the marathon record. I think it's it will be also good to give it a try once. Yeah. And then you came over to California and secured another victory at the Mammoth Trail Fast. And that really did sort of like put you in position to win the Golden Trail World Series again. Say a few words about that performance and more generally how you enjoyed coming over and racing in the United States again. 
Yeah, I really like to come to to USA because uh, for me it's completely different than in Switzerland. So it's really always cool to come there and to train there and to to race. And the people are nice, so like I am always motivated to come. And like in Mammoth, it was my first time there. So it was cool to discover a new new place. And the the race was really really fast. Like we had to run really fast from the start to the finish. So it was a good challenge for me. And that then it works well. So I was really happy about the US trip. Yeah. So backing up to Sierra's and all, of all the great wins and performances you've had, you have not won that iconic race in your home country of Switzerland. What happened there this year? Because that was sort of like the one blip on your racing resume. I think you had a DNF at Sierra's and all this year. So talk about that disappointment and how you think about that race as you know one of the goals for your career. Yeah, that was a huge disappointment because I was in the best shape of my life, I think, the week before the race. And I get a virus like two days before the race and I was completely out of my body. So uh, I try, but uh, it was not, uh, not uh, yeah, I think it was not good to push through because I, w- I would definitely not uh, not be good like uh, for Pikes Peak after, if I really push through this. And I directly see that it was impossible to to win this day, so I I decide to drop and to like to forget this year and to to go ahead for the next one. Yeah. But uh, it's a it's a bit a pity, but I know that I am capable of doing a great time there and maybe to win once. Yeah. So I will try, and uh, I think I will never stop before I I win once. I've never been to the race, Remy, but as somebody who has followed it for many years now, they say that it's difficult to get right. And for someone like you, who is the best climber in the world, you probably have to think of it as, you know, a situation where you play to that strength and you go as fast as you can up the double vertical K to start the race in order to, you know, keep that maybe the faster guys behind you on the flatter sections. Is that how you think about Zagama or more generally, you know, the, the difficulty and of strategically approaching that race. I think people would love to hear you talk about that. Yeah. It's a complicated race because you have everything. Like you have to be strong in uphill, strong in flat and also in downhill, because like, if you are with somebody at the end, you have to, to run fast the steep downhill. So yeah, I try to train a bit more on the flat this year to to be able to follow the, the African on the flat. So I think my my shape was really good also on the flat, but uh, I think I was just not uh, in my body for the race. Like the, the virus like just hit me and it was impossible to push like I want to push. Yeah. But uh, next year I will try to show that I am also a pretty fast runner in the flat and Maybe I will make a move there. <laughs> I'm sure you are, man. I'm sure you are. It's scary. Speaking of next year, Remy, we can start winding down now. I lo- I think uh, there's a lot of fans around the world who'd love to just sorry, hear you talk about your 2024 season, anything that you can reveal about what your goals are after the ski mountaineering season. What's trail running going to look like for you next year? Yeah, for sure. Next year will be again the, the Golden Trail Series. I will try again to win the title and... Then the races I will uh, like the goal will be Sierzinal, like will be the main goal, and then the other I did I don't decide yet like what I will do, but for sure I will come to USA to to do the races. But uh, then the other I I am not sure yet. I have to plan with my with my coach and my sponsors. Yeah, well, the, there's a new Golden Trail series here in my backyard in Northern California, the Headlands Race next year, and we would. <laughs> Certainly love to have you come to Marin County, California and uh, race here uh, on our home trails. It'll be great to see you here. I've been ending these conversations with the same question for everybody, Remy, and that is just to shout out one person on your team who exists behind the scenes, but who significantly contributes to your success. If you want to just give thanks to somebody who's, who's helped you in your career. Yeah, I think my girlfriend, she's always on my side, like to... She's always there, even if it's not uh, if I do a bad race or anything. So I think it's a huge motivation to for me, like to get back on my feet and to train harder. Yeah. So yeah, I think my girlfriend. <laughs> Amazing. Well, Remy, thank you so much for the time. I'd really love to have you back on the show and do a longer deeper dive on your life and your career, but congratulations on an amazing 2023 and being voted 
the number two trail runner of the year. Thanks a lot. Katie Scheid, welcome back to the program. It's great to see you. Happy holidays. Congratulations on being number two trail runner of the year. Thank you. Yeah, it's a uh, really cool news to hear and really honored to be part of even just like the considered considered for this or in the top 10 or yeah, it's cool to be here. Well deserved. Well deserved. So uh, it's just a couple of days before Christmas. This won't come out until we're well into January, but how are you feeling in general to close a great season of racing and a, another year of life? Yeah, I think it, I I kind of had to take some time recently to actually realize how much I'd done this year, which is a lot more than I've done in the past. Um, and I think in thinking through all of that, it even made me tired thinking about all the things I did and it kind of gave me another like reminder to keep taking things pretty low key or like, I don't want to say easy, but just uh, being respectful of the fact that I did a lot this year and trying not to push too hard too soon for 2024. I was going to ask you about that too. So maybe before we get into some of the details of your racing season, expand on that because you did do a lot and it, you basically were racing from February to October at a very high level. And all of your performances were really impressive. What do you do now to ensure that you do absorb all that and you enter 2024 with health and confidence and freshness? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think part of it, uh, actually, I know that most of it was because I had finished my PhD last year. So I definitely had more like time on the side to dedicate to like planning, logistics, training, resting. Um, whereas in the past I would kind of use maybe the spring, the, the winter spring to maybe try to work a little bit more without moving too much. So I kind of, I just had more time on my hands this year. Um, and I think that's, that's why I ended up doing a lot more. Um, uh, but I also feel like it was still within my means. So for next year, yeah, I'm, I mean, I haven't been in this situation before I think every year I kind of change a little bit what I do and I think it keeps things fresh so like every every January isn't the same and every February isn't the same so just kind of following <laughs> yeah how I want to approach this year and some same goals as last year but uh kind of approaching them a slightly different way I guess just with like different timing all right well we'll talk more about that in a second you started your year at the, the Coastal Challenge, and this is a race that I've always heard about that's intrigued me and that I've heard is much more difficult than it appears on paper. So start there. Tell us about that experience and how it set up the rest of your season. Yeah, same for me. It was something I'd always heard about, and I remember seeing um, like all of Ian Corliss's photos from a lot of different athletes over the years in February and kind of had always kind of thought like, Oh, there's absolutely no way I'm going to, I would ever do that because it's in February and that's where I'm skiing. And like, I wouldn't be able to go run. I forget what it is. 250 K and in a week, that's like way over my head. And then <laughs> Western States came around on my calendar and I was like, huh, maybe I could use this to my advantage and use it as like kind of a training camp to get things started on running um, earlier in the winter than I normally would. And it also gave me a chance to sort of like put myself in a hot situation. I'm not saying that like any heat training I did in February carried over to June, but I think mentally like knowing what it feels like to be hot, to be in like that kind of environment was just like good to know ahead of time. Oh. So I took advantage of that. And that's like, that's basically why I went uh, to the Coastal Challenge. I'd also heard like really great things from a lot of different athletes. Um, but yeah, I would, uh, I would agree that it is way harder than, than I thought it was going to be. It's, and not even in the way that you might think. I mean, it was the biggest running week of my life, uh, still is. And that wasn't even the hard part. The hard part was like, you're just sweating nonstop for like six days. 
you're barely sleeping because it's so hot and you have to get the start is right at sunrise. So you're, you're having to get up at like, I think we're getting up at like three or four in the, yeah, three or four in the morning. Um, and it's just impossible to sleep. There's like, you have strange bug bites, strange rashes, you're sweating nonstop. And on top of that, you're doing the biggest running week of your life. So you're just soaking wet for a solid week. (laughs) Yeah. The, you're like running through water and sweating and you don't, and then you're like trying to put sunscreen on and not chafe. It's yeah. <laughs> it sounds like fun. Sounds like fun and a great way to start. Yeah. The season. <laughs> so obviously the major goal, at least in the first half of the year was Western States where you ran one of the great hundred mile performances ever. And what I'd love to hear you just talk about is, you know, f- just recalling back as somebody who you know, basically watched every second of your race play out the time that you did spend with Courtney and just like the fact that you guys were able to sort of push each other to such historic performances. Are there any memories from sharing time out there on the trail or anything you want to say in general about how Courtney helped push you to one of the best performances of your career and in the history of the race? Yeah, def- I mean, for sure. I've said this in other places too, but I think for me as my, like my first, uh, Western States, I didn't really know how the whole thing worked basically for the first, uh, especially at the beginning of a race, you don't know if it goes out hot, if people group up, like how it typically plays out. So I was pretty happy to have her there to kind of have as a buddy, like kind of a little tour guide for the beginning of the race. Like I felt like she was taking me under her wing, like, okay, this is what we do now. <laughs> and that was, that was great for me. Cause I think if she hadn't, I don't know what would happen if she hadn't been there, but it kind of gave me the confidence to like take the starting speed as it went and uh, stick together through the snowy part. And then she was always in my vision until, I mean, she was like on the edge of my vision until, uh, yeah, around forest till, I guess. Um, after Forest Hill, I would say uh, that was like her own thing that I was not part of at all. And I don't think she was really part of my race at all after that because she just did a Courtney thing and blew our minds. Um, but yeah, up until that point, I felt like she was sort of like my tugboat, like guiding me along the Western States course. And I'm I'm glad that going back this year, I'll, I kind of have those memories of how that played out. Awesome. Well, we'll come to the 2024 Western States here before we close our conversation. One of the things that Corinne and I were just talking about in our end of year podcast was just your range. And I think for me as a fan, you're the type of athlete that I love rooting for and watching just somebody who can compete across all different distances and terrains. So if there's anything you want to say about that or generally like where you see your strengths at this point in your career and where your motivations lie, you know, or is it that your motivation and and the strength is the versatility in the range? Um, Yeah. Well, thanks for the nice words about that. I would say that there's actually athletes with like, I would say the better range than me. Uh, Jim is actually a great example. We all forget how uh, fantastic he performed that years now a few years ago way faster than I would ever finish in that field um so that's just one example I mean Francesco Pupi also stepped up to some longer races this year which was cool to see um so I think there, there's it's it's nice of you to say but I also don't feel like it's a, a super unique thing um but yeah no I I'm mostly just motivated by kind of whatever motivates me and it doesn't have to have a certain distance number on it or like terrain or specificity. Like I also like competing in the local cross country running races here with my club. I like schema races. I like, uh, yeah, 50 K hundred mile, really anything that I start to get excited about when I think about is what motivates me. So I, I don't really have like, a defined um yeah type of race that i i'm most interested in yeah i was just looking at your results again and it was like races from four hours to 27 hours plus the coastal challenge which was a week-long <laughs> stage race it was just like 
a lot of stuff. And then, like you said, on top of that, maybe cross country and ski mountaineering. I'm sure there's a lot of value in keeping things diverse and fresh like that. And obviously I'm sort of referencing there, you know, your range being exemplified in the turnaround between Western States and then OCC where you finished second. I just talked to German, as you know, and one of the things that I asked him was something that you had said earlier in the season. I can't remember where, where you said that you guys had decided to target different races. And with the exception of Diagonal Defu, you, you did, you raced in different events and you both had, you know, probably the best seasons of your careers. To what extent do you attribute that decision to the success that you both experienced this season? Um, I think it's hard to separate out, out all the variables, but um, I think most of it was just that we each really were uh, deliberate in which events motivated each of us the most. I think sometimes in the past we were, we sort of had this like unspoken agreement that we would always do the same races and maybe it wasn't always the race that we were each individually most motivated by. I'm not sure if that like had some influence on that. And I felt like this year it was really, we each were like, okay, this is what I want to do. And I think it really made, at least me, I don't, I would have to ask him, but I think it really made me own it more like, okay, this is really what I want to do. Like, this is my decision, like totally for me. Um, not like, I mean, obviously we share a lot together, but it, it's, uh, I think when you're racing as an individual, you need to like have that individual motivation. So I think that's where a lot of it came from. Um, and also just, we've been in, we've both been in the sport actually like a kind of a while now. And oh. I think our, <laughs> all the experience is starting to finally like get pieced together in a more consistent and bigger way. Yeah. Okay. So before we start looking forward, anything you want to say about the Grand Raid? I was just talking to Germán about it also, and it seemed like you guys had both come to the decision of like, okay, we're going to do one more. Like, why don't we bolt on one of the hardest races in the world? Of course, you won. He finished second place. A great way to end the season. But you also posted some just like, you know, hilarious stuff that those of us who have been through the ordeal of the Grand Raid can identify with. So maybe tell the people about that ridiculous experience and, you know, how it put a nice conclusion to your season. Yeah. Uh, such. I mean, it's hard to speak about the Grand Raid with people who don't understand what it is. So it's nice that, you know, but yeah, it's just its own experience. Um, we definitely watched your video, um, you know, in the lead up to get in the mood. <laughs> <laughs> talked about you with Fabrice death. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's, it's such a great event. And I think it's funny because of all the things I did this year, it's actually not the first thing that comes to my mind. Cause it was, as you said, sort of like, okay, let's add one more. It wasn't like the focus of the whole season, but in France, because it's televised, everyone here like that's all they know about what I did this year so anyone I see in France is like oh congrats oh like you, but I think they're talking about I don't know like Western States or OCC but they're just talking about the Grand Raid because they watched it on TV and um so that's pretty funny uh that like how well known it is in France um as opposed to I watched a ton of it US. myself Oh, okay. Yeah. So you there's one tell viewing French point friends in to the turn into the Western States live stream too. That's telling. Well, once you start doing it in French, they will, I think. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I got to start practicing. <laughs> but no, it's such a great event. And it, it was kind of fun for us because we did both do it together, which, yeah, of course, adds a little bit of stress. But um, I, I actually think it was really fun to do it together because there's a lot of like recon that's super difficult logistically, as you know. Um, and we got to like kind of share that. And it's just such a different setting that you kind of had this sort of like vacation y feel to it, even though we weren't there on vacation. But um, it was just kind of a nice end point. Yeah. All right. So let's look ahead. You have accepted the F2 bib at Western States. So tell us to, you know, whatever degree you would like to reveal what 2024 looks like, what are your goals and uh, yeah, where people can expect to see you. 
Yeah, so the <laughs> I I'm still in a lot of the like brainstorming uh finding my motivation process right now, especially as I said, because I'm still kind of processing this last year. But uh because I did have to confirm Western states, I did confirm Western states. And I will probably also be at Canyons for the hundred K. Uh, I think it's a good opportunity to to basically do a dress rehearsal um, in the same, I saw it was in the same direction this year. And I was like, all right, why not? Like you, you've got a planned dress rehearsal, <laughs> like yeah. get a good spacing of the race. So I think it's a good uh, chance to come over uh, just before canyons and then stay until Western States. And after that, I haven't decided yet. Um, yeah. Not really yep. sure. Got a, ton of different ideas and not not sure what's going to catch yep sounds good well katie congratulations on an awesome season i've been ending these conversations with the same question for everybody and it's been a fun way to put a bow on 2023 and that is just to to give kudos or recognition to somebody on your team who exists mostly behind the scenes who doesn't get enough kudos for how they've contributed to your success oh well, I mean, the first person who comes to mind is Jarmal because he's part of training every single day. Um, yeah, he's part of everything. Um, even when I'm in the U.S. for two months, he's still there uh, as the main support team. But I'm also going to give a shout out to his parents who are basically like the behind the scene logistics warehouse people uh, who keep things moving when when we're not able to so maybe just his whole family <laughs> yeah, cool seems like a great family and it sounds like you guys are go all going to celebrate christmas together now yes <laughs> great well katie again congratulations on an awesome season i'm looking forward to seeing you at canyons if not before and uh have a great rest of the year and we'll uh we'll see you next year perfect sounds good thanks